Uh, if you would turn with me to Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to begin reading at verse 16 and go into 21. And as you're turning and finding your way there, I just want to kind of set the stage a little bit for uh, this sermon series that we're going to be learning of and kind of set the stage on what's going on here in this letter that Paul is writing to these churches in Galatia. Paul had visited uh, Galatia uh, at some point in his missionary work and he helped to found, to found churches there and uh, he taught them a gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But sometime after he departed from the place, he he got word or got message or uh, learned that they had departed from the gospel that he had taught them and that they had kind of reverted back to uh, the works of the law. They, they had forgot about the grace, we just talked about it, the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace of the cross, and they kind of went back to uh, trying to fulfill the law. And, and, and Paul is writing this letter, and it's interesting that as he's writing this letter, uh, if you are familiar with most of the letters of Paul, you see that he usually starts with some type of Thanksgiving greeting. He usually says, hey, I, I am just so thankful to be a part of your lives. And I'm just so thankful to be able to write to you right now, and I'm thankful of the work that you're doing. He usually starts his letter off uh, really uh, on a really good and positive note before he delves into uh, the meat of the subject. But here in this letter, he doesn't do that. In this, in this letter, there's no opening salutation, and there's also no closing salutation that we're used to seeing uh, in his letters. And, and, and you may want to note that because it kind of lends to the importance of what he's saying. He writes to this church in Galatia, he says, look, I've got to get straight. To the point. Uh, this thing that I'm writing to you about is so urgent and so important that I don't have time to go through all of the uh, normal customs of, the, of letter writing. I, I, I just need to bypass all of the, all of the uh, what do you call them, all of the niceties or uh, all of that stuff. I need to just get right to the point because what I'm about to dissertate to you, what I'm about to say to you is of utmost importance. Galatians 5, 16 to 21. And the word says, I say then, walk in the spirit, that you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that they do not do the things, so that you do not do the things which you wish, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and then he throws this in, and the like. So he's saying, in case I miss something, anything that's like these things. He says, of which I tell you beforehand, I'm telling you before you even get involved in them, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul does us a great service by giving us a list of things that describe what are known as the works of the flesh. And before we can get into the fruit of the spirit, and before we can get into the icing on the cake, we have to First, deal with some things. Before we go to uh, the good side of Paul's message, before we get to the light side of things, we have to first deal with the dark side of things. Paul gives us some things to steer clear of. He gives us some things to 
be concerned about. Some, he gives us what I like to call some don't do's before he gives us the do do's. See, oftentimes in our preaching and our witnessing to others, we, we, uh, we'll be well served if we would focus more on the do do's than rather the don't do. See, a lot of people who are not in church, a lot of people who don't have relationships with Christ, or they feel that it's so hard because it's all about what you can't do. The focus for them is always on what you don't do. But really, as you begin to walk with Christ and, and get closer to Christ, you understand that when you focus on the do-dos, then the don't-dos aren't that big of a problem. See, it's not that we don't listen to uh, bad music. Are we? It's not that we don't watch bad television or bad movies. It's that we fill ourselves up with other stuff that we don't have room for. Bad music. See, when we listen to gospel music, when we listen to, to music that is edifying, that's building up, and as you grow closer to God through his word, then you start to lose your appetite. For those other things. So it's not, listen, I, I have a personal testimony. I love hip hop and R&B music. I, I mean, I, I, am a, I, I am a renaissance, neo soul type of guy. I just love that type of music. But as I began to get serious about the Lord, I started to listen to a little more Kirk Franklin, a little more Israel and New Breed a little more of casting crowns and various other artists. And what I noticed is that my playlist on my, oh, you know, I, I had CD player back there. You guys, you know, you guys got little big things like that, that hold like 10 million songs in this little device. But, but back then when I was uh, in my early 20s, you know, we had these CD players and that was the big thing. Man, those things cost about $200. For, for this big old CD thing that you had to do, and it had earphones, and I would walk around with that, and, and I even had a connection for my car. And, and, but the thing about the CDs is you had, to, you had to have the CDs. So if you wanted to listen to all of this stuff, you, you had to have about 20 or 30 CDs. And, 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 you know, before the computers really got sophisticated enough to burn CDs, you couldn't really make a mixed CD, so you had to have the individual CD of every artist. Oh, come on now. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? So I had CDs of all of my favorite hip-hop artists. I had CDs of all of my favorite R&B artists, my neo-soul artists. And I would have these CDs and I would, you know, and I knew on Tuesdays was the, the day that the new CDs released. And, you know, I would always indulge in these dif this different uh, CDs, this music that I love to listen to. But as I got serious about the Lord, I discovered other CDs, other music. And before long, the, the CDs I used to listen to started to collect dust because they were being replaced with this new stuff. Especially that I realized that, that most of the songs we sing actually are Bible verses. See, I never even realized that those are Bible verses that we were singing. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I, I think that was David that wrote that, amen? So, so, I, so that was just like a, 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 a light bulb moment for me. I said, oh, so this is how you get the word into your spirit. This is how you walk according to the spirit instead of according to the flesh. So it wasn't that I just stopped listening to this or that. And, and, and let me just uh, make a caveat here is that, you know, secular music does not mean that it's evil music. See, the difference between secular and sacred are the lyrics. Are you following me? So just because something is not, not necessarily a gospel song doesn't mean that it's evil, but you just got to watch the lyrics. Pay attention to what you're listening to. Because, see, the lyrics have power. Did you guys know that the devil was a musician? He was the archangel of worship before he was cast out of heaven. But the Bible says that the gifts and the calling are without repentance, so he was cast out, but he still has the gift. Are you following me? So he still has the gift of music. That's why the stuff that, 
the, the stuff that's really bad for you in music, it sounds so good. Listen, I could play a song right now and have you all bouncing in church. Amen? Because he still has that power. So, so <clears throat> excuse me. So, what I'm saying is, Paul is telling us not to walk according to the works of the flesh. He's saying to these churches in this region called Galatia, he's saying, look, you, you, you've abandoned what I first taught you when I was with you. See, how many of you know it's really good to say amen at church? It's not easy to say amen on the job. It's not easy to say amen at school to what the pastor said at church. Because people at school and people at work may have a contrary opinion. See, it's always easy to be Christian at church. Everybody pretty much agrees. We're all in agreement on, on, on what's being said and what's being taught in the Word. But when you go to work, somebody challenges, challenges what you believe. And you have to be bold to stand up for it. So these people, uh, these Galatian people and these Galatian churches, they were, they were turning back to the old ways. They wanted to revert back to the legalistic type of relationship with the Lord. People always want to earn their salvation through their works. Even us, even in this building, we have a tendency to want to earn our salvation by the work that we do. We say, hey man, I get up early on Sunday morning and I come and help and set up after church. That's got to be good for something. But that's very dangerous. See, what apparently had happened in these churches is that when Paul left, there, there rose up some other teachers that, that came back and, and, and tried to discredit what Paul was saying and, and started to get the people's hearts and minds turned back to the Jewish customs of keeping the Mosaic law. So, so Paul got wind of this and he writes back to him. He says, look, he, uh, I love the way he says, how soon? In Galatians chapter 1, 6, he said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon. I marvel that you just got out of church. And now you're acting the way that you were acting before you went to church. He said, I marvel that you turn away so soon from him who called you to the grace of Christ, to a different gospel. Paul is saying, beware of different gospels. Anybody have an example of different Gospels? Come on now, you know, they knock on your door, I think, around Wednesdays at about 11 o'clock or so. They come knocking at your door and they want to hand you a pamphlet based on a different Gospel. Their Gospel, inter interesting enough, Interestingly enough, is the gospel of works. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Jehovah Witness, Mormons have two things have, have that in common. Their gospel is based upon works. The fact that they come to your house on Wednesday, that's their work. You see, that's why it's so easy for them to. To, to do what they do and to evangelize and to go on missionary journeys because it's part of their works. It's part of them earning their salvation. Oh, we got a lot to learn from them, though. You see, in, 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 in the traditional Protestant evangelical church, we're called to, called to the mission of evangelism, but whenever we have evangelism outreach, people disappear. Because we know that we're saved by grace, so let somebody else do <laughs> the work. <laughs> but Brother James warns us that faith without works is dead. And we'll get into that. So, but the Bible lets us know in Galatians 2 and 16, it said that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is writing about. This is what Paul is trying to say that's so important. That if you can get it down into your spirit, if you can understand that, that your relationship with Christ is not based on what you do, but based on what he's done. 
then your walk with Christ will be so much easier. Your walk with Christ will be so much clearer to you because you'll understand that, 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 that when I fail, that when I fall down, that, that doesn't mean that my relationship with, with God is over because it was never based on my performance in the first place. The Bible says that a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. The seven represents the number of completion. It's not that you only have seven times to mess up. That was just an indication. If you, if you subscribe to numerology, that's just an indication that you fall down, but you get back up again. What the soul says, we fall down, but we get up. For a saint is just a sinner who fell down and got up. That's what that song is about. The reason that we can get up is because of God's grace. It's because of our faith in Jesus Christ is the reason that we can keep getting up. Are you following me? Paul urges us to, to not to turn away from the truth of the gospel. Because he knows in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says that for grace you've been saved through faith. It is a gift of God. Are you following me? It's, it's a gift of God. Then he says, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what happens when you have a gospel of works? When you have a gospel of works, you tend to compare your works to the next person's works. And that causes strife and division within the church because you begin to compare your works to other works. Never compare what you're doing for the kingdom of God to what someone else is doing for the kingdom of God. Now you just may be uh, serving coffee in the morning before service. Now I may be preaching the word of God as servants, but we're all in the service of the kingdom of God and God doesn't look at them as, as one being more important than the other. They all serve their purpose. When you serve the coffee in the morning so that people can, can get their energy up, some people need coffee in the morning to get energy up. Everybody, can I get an amen? Because we didn't have the coffee ready this morning and, and the brothers were mad. <laughs> Texting me and everything. We don't have coffee, we don't have sugar. I was looking forward to that. But, but, but when you provide that service, then people are able uh, uh, to have that extra bit of energy so that they can sit and listen to Pastor Chuck as he goes on and on and on and on and on. You know, but that does a service for people. And that is important. When you come to help to fold the programs and pass them out and, and, and put all the inserts in there so that, the, that everybody has the notes uh, uh, for the sermon today, that is a service and that, that helps us to have a more full and complete ministry time together. And they are important. You set the signs out on the street, that's important because people drive by and they see the signs and they say, hey, what's going on in there? We need to let people know that we're here worshiping the Lord. So you have to really be careful for, uh, from the works of salvation because they're also a subtle danger that leads to heresy and apostasy. Heresy, preaching a different gospel. Apostasy, falling away from the faith. Those two organizations we mentioned before, that's how they started. They looked for a new gospel, a new revelation. Listen, there is no new revelation least not to God. It may be new to you, but it's not to him. So be careful when you, when you uh, get yourself attached to a ministry or a church that says, hey, we got something new to say about what the Bible says. We have this new revelation. Be careful of a prophet or a teacher that comes and say, hey, hey, I got something new. God is not giving any new revelation. He may give new interpretation on his old revelation, but there is no, there's no, there's no new way to serve God. There's no new way to get to heaven. It's the same as it was when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to me except, to the Father except, but through me. See, the thing about having a, a, a gospel of, of, of works and salvation the problem with that is that nobody can perfectly fulfill the law. Nobody could be perfect at fulfilling the law, but thank God that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law perfectly. 
See, you and I can't fulfill the law. If we're going to fall short in some way, some form, some fashion, we're going to trip up and mess up some way, some form, some fashion. Prior to Jesus Christ, we, re- we, we celebrated last week, we celebrated the re- death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which signifies the full, perfect atonement for the law. Jesus said, look, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. How did he fulfill the law? Through his death, burial, and resurrection. See, prior to that, there had to be a yearly sacrifice, what you call a scapegoat. They would get a, a young goat or a young lamb, and, they, and everybody would, would cast their sins on this, this young, perfect lamb. The lamb had to be without spot or blemish. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago when we discussed the Passover. So we had to have this perfect lamb, this perfect goat, amen? You had to have this perfect lamb, and everybody would cast their sins upon this lamb, and, 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 and then they would sacrifice one lamb, and they would send one lamb out into the wilderness to, to suffer whatever that it would suffer as a sign of your sins being taken away from you. But you had to do that every year. But when Jesus said, he said, I'm coming and I'm the perfect sacrifice. I'm the, I'm the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. So this is what Paul is trying to remind them of. He's trying to remind them that, look, your salvation is in Jesus Christ. It's not in the works that you perform. It's not based upon your performance because your performance will never, ever be enough. Are you following me? It has to be by Jesus Christ because the Bible says that he made him who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. You all know what God says about our righteousness. He doesn't care how many hospitals have our name on them. He doesn't care how many people we feed. He doesn't care how many... Uh, uh, how much money we donate to charities. He doesn't look at that and say, oh man, you sure are righteous. What he calls that, according to Isaiah, says your righteousness is as a filthy rag. He says your, your righteousness fails in comparison to the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ. So what he says in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness. What that means that every time God looks at us, he has to look through the lens of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be saved by grace and not of works. That means that every time uh, God looks at you, he has to first look through Jesus. And when he looks through Jesus, he sees perfection. When he looks through Jesus, he sees one who was tempted in all points, but yet sinned not. He sees one that laid down his life for his friend. He sees the perfect sacrifice. So every time he looks at us, he has to look through Jesus. Are you following me? Oh, what a blessing that is. You guys should be a little more excited about that. See, what the enemy does, he wants you to look at you. He wants you to look at all all the times that you failed. He wants you to look at all of your shortcomings and misgivings. He wants you to look at all of those bad habits that you carry and so that you'll look at yourself and say, hey, well, I'm not worthy of the righteousness of God. And that's the truth. You're not worthy, but through Christ Jesus, you are made worthy. So Paul is telling this church in Galatia, uh, uh, you need to get past trying to fulfill the law. The law remains and it remains for two reasons. The law remains to convict us and to point us to redemption. That's what the law serves today. It convicts us to let us know that we're doing wrong. Listen, if if you even have a burden on your heart about the stuff that you do that's wrong, then that's that's the Holy Spirit working in you, and that's a good sign. You should be scared when you stop having those feelings. You should be scared when, when, when you go to the, uh, the liquor store to purchase uh, whatever you like to drink and you don't have any feelings about it. Listen, if you, if you go and you, you, you start to second guess, should I, should I really be here? If that goes on inside of you, uh, when you start to think about that, then that's a good sign. That's a sign that the spirit is still working in your life. Now you may still go to the register and check out and... Ask for a couple of cups like the one I have here. 
But it's a good sign that you have that conviction in your heart. When you go, that means that you're not too far. Once you get to the point where that doesn't bother you at all, then you are really in a dangerous situation because you can't even feel the Lord's presence in your life. That equates to spiritual death. So Paul lays the groundwork for these churches in Galatia. And he tries to drive home the point that it's not by your works that you're saved. And he sets that up and then he goes into this great list of things to give us some practical examples of what it means to walk in the flesh. The flesh, the Greek word is sarx, it means the body as opposed to the soul, which is your mind or your spirit. It refers to the carnal or human nature of man, meaning man and woman. Then he goes on in his list in Galatians chapter 5, and he lists some things for us, and uh, these things are commonly categorized into four categories. First set, the sins of moral impurity. The next set, the sins of idolatry and sorcery. Then there's the sins that violate the laws of love. And lastly, the sins of intemperance. So let's look at these sins one by one, and we'll just discuss them briefly uh, as we're just using these to set the stage for the fruit of the Spirit that we'll discuss in the next two weeks. The first is fornication. Take it from the word porneia. Doesn't need a whole lot of explanation for what fornication means, but, but uh, I'll say that it extends beyond just unwed sexual relationships. It extends to any type of illicit sexual activity. It refers to adultery. That's uh, having relationships, physical, sexual, intimate relationships with someone you're not married to. Is that clear? Premarital sex, prostitution, homosexuality, incest, all those things kind of go under this umbrella of fornication. Interesting enough, in the news on this week, there's a couple, brother and sister, in Germany, who are waging this campaign to make incest legal. Now these things are going on in our world today where people who are brother and sister are trying to make ancestral relationships legal. Not going to stay there too long. Then it goes into uncleanness. Uncleanness means a soiled or dirty mindset, an impure mind. So we got to watch the way we think. The Bible says, uh, uh, leading up to this, it says, uh, uh, it says, excuse me, let, let me get to it so I, I don't misquote it. He said, I say then, walk in the Spirit so, you should not, so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It says, walk in the Spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. What that means is, to walk in the Spirit means that you have to have a spiritual mindset as opposed to a fleshly mindset mindset. What he's saying that there's two things going on. He said the, the flesh will always war against the spirit and the spirit will always war against the flesh, but the battle occurs in your mind. Are you tracking with me? Your flesh is always at war with your spirit. Christianity 101, we are we are one being, but we possess three qualities too that make us who we are. We have a spirit, we have a mind, and we live in a body. Those are the three aspects of a human, pe of a human being. We're not just flesh. We're not just this, 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 this skin and bone that you see before. That's not, that does not comprise our total being. We have a spirit. And then we also have a mind. And the mind is the middle man. It's like the man that had the two dogs. And the two dogs would always fight against each other. 
And someone comes along and says, man, your, your dogs are always fighting against each other. He said, yeah, they're always fighting, but I get to decide who wins. The guy says, hey, well, well how do you decide which one wins? He said, the one I feed is the one that will win. The one I feed will be the stronger, so it'll always win. Th those dogs represent our flesh and our spirit. What we feed them is through our minds. This is why we must watch what we allow to come into our minds. Through our music, through our television, through the, the, the activities that we engage in, through the types of things that we put into our bodies, drugs, alcohol. Are you following me? Because we want to make sure that, that we feed the right dog. We got to make sure that the right dog gets fed because we understand that this is spiritual warfare that's taking place in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you following me? So uncleanness, which is a soiled or dirty mind. Listen, what you watch. You watch too much reality television. You watch too many music videos. What are you feeding? Who's, what dog is getting fed? So the next time you watch, you're going through VH1, MTV, and you stop and you start to watch, you're going to hear Pastor Chuck's voice say to you, what dog are you feeding? And that should convict you one way or another. Then he talks about lewdness. Hmm, sounds like such... That, that word just sounds nasty, right? It just it doesn't sound good, lewdness. And, and, and the definitions are even, sound even worse. Lasciviousness. Licentiousness. A lot of L's. Amen? Sensuality. Sexual excess in a public way. Lewdness. Shameless behavior without regard to others. Can, can I make this practical to you all? You know, sometimes we see young ladies that like to wear pants that they, can, you, they show their undergarments. That's lewdness. Are, are you following me? When, when, when you dress in a way that draws attention uh, to yourself in, in a way and you, and you just don't care about what anybody has to say about it, listen, young man, young lady, I don't want to see your underwear. Are you following me? That's what, that's what Paul is referring to as lewdness. Shameless behavior. You've heard me say it a thousand times. Where there's no shame, there's no honor. So when you live in a society where people become shameless, then you have not the counterpart, which is honor. Those are the sins of moral impurity, Paul says. And then there's the sins of idolatry and sorcery. Idolatry means the worship of images. The worship of anything other than God. Are you following me? Idolatry, idol worship, generally starts off on a good note. It's just, you usually start with a symbol of what that represents. But then before long, you remove the symbol and you start worshiping it, the God. Are you following me? So Paul is warning uh, this church in Galatia. He's warning us, this church in America. He's saying, beware of idolatry. Beware of how much, how much emphasis you put on your athletes, your entertainers. Beware of how you follow them on Twitter and Facebook. Are, are you following me? Nothing in and of itself wrong with that, but just beware of uh, uh, that you're not causing that to become idolatry in your life. Are you following me? Because listen, a lot of your athletes, your entertainers, those people that, that we enjoy, uh, they don't have a sense of right and wrong at all. It's just that, that their gift has given them a platform to have influence over millions and millions of people. So they say these things, and it sounds like on the side of their neck, and it sounds good to our young people, and our young people take it as gospel. Follow me? You guys like Lady Gaga? She's like a really good girl. She's doing a lot to, to uh, tolerance. Her thing is, everything we, everybody should just be tolerant of everybody else. But that's not what the Bible tells us to do. 
The Bible says it's to rebuke and correct with love. Now, that doesn't mean that we go around condemning everybody, but we should be judging. But Come on now. One of the favorite scriptures of non-Christians and non-believers is, thou shalt not judge. <laughs> Isn't it? They may not know any other scripture at all, but, but their favorite one is, thou shalt not judge. And I see a lot of the athletes, they even tattoo it. They say, nobody can judge me but God. That's absolutely, uh, totally incorrect. The Bible tells believers to judge other believers. But the right word is, the right word that should be there is thou shalt not condemn. Meaning that we don't have a heaven or hell to put you in, so we can't condemn anybody for their behavior, but we definitely should judge according to the word of God. If I share with you with love, if the word of God says about your behavior, your conduct, with love, you know how you do it with love? You do it with love is that you admit that, hey, I'm not perfect. But what's the first thing that they, they accuse you of trying to, oh, you're holier than now, right? That's the defense mechanism that the enemy has given them to scare you away, to intimidate you. Are you following me? So we are to judge. We are to, we are to take account of what people are going on, what things are going on in the lives of other believers. Amen? So you got to be careful of those types of things. So he says, look, be, he says, beware of idolatry. And then he says sorcery. Oh, I love this one. Because many of us don't even realize what modern day sorcery looks like. The guy on the corner selling crack, he's a warlock, a sorcerer. The word sorcery comes from a word pharmakeia, where we get the word pharmacy, medicine. That guy at the meth lab, and girls, I guess, in the meth labs, they're dealing in sorcery, witchcraft. They're dealing in mind-altering substances. Are you following me? In order to manipulate your mind and to manipulate your behavior. That's what sorcery is. It's, it's witchcraft. See, we think of witchcraft, we think of these, this old witch with these warts on her nose around this big cauldron of bubbling uh, uh, something with frogs, eyes, and, and all of this stuff, and it's just smoldering over. And we say, oh, that's witchcraft. But the witchcraft is more subtle than you think. Ooh. The Bible talks about everything. See, we think that we're doing new stuff. In this century, we think that all of this stuff is new, but all this stuff is not new. Look, Saul went to see that witch in Endor, and she gave him some little something to smoke. And he started to see things. He saw Samuel <laughs> talking to him. Samuel was dead. He started to see things. Come on, you, fall, you know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all act like y'all ain't never, ever been high. Uh, look, look, you like Bill Clinton. Yeah, yeah, I, did, I, I smoked it, but I didn't inhale. Some of us could testify to the fact of what sorcery, what mind altercation takes place when you start to indulge in illicit drugs and alcohol. Amen. How many bad stories have you heard that start with this phrase? Well, I had a little too much to drink. That's why I slept with your sister. Because we had a little too much to drink and then one thing led to another. Come on now, you guys not... Saying amen. This is, this is one of those out sermons. All right. All right. Then he says, sins that violate the laws of love, which are hatred, contentions, and jealousies. Hatred, hostility, in, enmity, uh, direct opposite of love. It puts, it puts barriers between you and other people. That's what hatred does. Hatred sets up a wall, a barrier uh, between you and other people to get people uh, away from you, to keep them at uh, arm's length or, or a stone's throw away. So you have to be careful of hatred and carrying hate in your heart. Then he says contentions. This is the expression of the hatred. This is when these are people who like to cause strife. You ever, be, you ever have anybody in your life that just loves to argue? They just, they just doesn't matter what it's about. They just love to argue. You want to go to Cold Stone, they want to go to Baskin and Robbins. Doesn't really matter to you, you just want some ice cream. But, but to them, it's got to be Baskin and Robbins. And then the next time you want to go to Baskin and Robbins, they want to go to Cold Stone. 
I mean, some people are just contentious by nature, and you really just don't like to be around them. But all of us have that, that one friend. I can, I can name all of my friends that were like that, but for some reason they just always wanted to argue, but they were always around. Amen? So be careful of being contentious and causing discord. And then he says, uh, be careful of jealousies. The word zealous, it means to have zeal. Now there's a good zeal and there's a bad zeal. You can have zeal for the things of God, and that's obviously a good thing. You can have zeal for serving others, and that's a good thing. But when you have zeal for your own selfish reasons, that's when it becomes a work of the flesh. Then he says, outburst of wrath. Come on, you know this person. That's just me, dog. That's just how I am. That's just how I raise. I jump on people. I, just, I, I lose my cool. That's just how I am. That's just how I'm wired. You, you know people that, that, that they, make mis- they make excuses for their behavior. But these people just have no control over their temper. They have no, their, 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 uh, their uh, what do you call it, their thermometers, not thermostats. You know the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? A thermostat controls the temperature. A thermometer only tells what the temperature is. So if it's 100 degrees, then, then that person is just going to act 100 degrees. But a thermometer, see, as Christians, we need to have a thermometer mindset. That means that, that when the temperature gets too high, we know how to dial it down. We know how to count down before we blast off. Are you following me? So he says, beware of outbursts of wrath, fits of rage, blazing temper. It, it, see, it, there's a difference between a righteous indignation in an outburst of wrath. See, there are some things when it comes to the word of God that that I get righteously angry about. I get angry when I see uh, people who call themselves pastors or prophets or prophetess or whatever they call themselves and then they fleece the flock. They manipulate the congregation for their own selfish gain. Now that gives me a righteous indignation. That makes me very mad and very upset. Righteous indignation is when Jesus walked into the church, the temple, and saw that the, the people who were collecting the money at the temple were taking advantage of the people, saying, hey, your dove is not good enough. We have these special doves that we can sell you at an elevated price so that you will have the proper dove to sacrifice. And when Jesus saw that, the Bible says that he overturned the tables and began to spank them with a whip. You guys didn't know that about Jesus, did you? You just thought he was just that cute little guy on the picture with the halo around his head. That oh, that's beautiful. You, you guys thought you, you guys think of that Jesus, but Jesus had a little bit of righteous indignation in him. He turned over the tables not once but twice that they record that he did that. That's one of the things that made me fall in love with Jesus. Is that I say, oh, Jesus was a real man. He wasn't just. You know, that guy in the picture with all the birds and animals around him and just looks so peaceful all the time, turn the other cheek and all that. No, when it was time to get down, Jesus got down. And Jesus rolled with people who got down. You guys seen what Peter did in the Garden of Gethsemane. When they came to put hands on Jesus, what did Peter do? Cut the man's ear off. That means Peter was strapped. Am I keeping it too ghetto for you guys? But Peter had his knife on him. And it was one of those good knives because Peter was a fisherman, right? And you know that the fisher, the, 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 the knife you use in fish, you, it has to be really sharp. So, so, Peter, so Peter didn't hang around a bunch of punks. I mean, God, Jesus didn't hang around a bunch of punks. He knew that, you know, he needed to have a posse that could protect him, that could lay hands on the sick. Are you following me? Then he says, beware of selfish ambitions. This is having a self-centered attitude. This is when you do things just to get recognition for it. Say, yeah, I, I get up early and come and help Pastor Chuck set up the church. Yeah, yeah, pat me on the back for that. And you want to have recognition. And, and when you see somebody else get recognized, you get, you get upset. Well, well, I did that too, and, and why aren't they saying my name? 
That's selfish ambition. That means you have the wrong motive. That means that you have the wrong heart. The Bible, uh, one thing I love about the word of God, it says that what you do secretly, God will reward you openly. So he said, don't do things to be seen. Talking to the Pharisees, he said, don't pray in the, in the middle of the street so that people can see you. That doesn't mean that you should never pray in the middle of the street. If God unctions you to go outside in that street and pray for this neighborhood, then by all means, do so. Tim Tebow, it's okay to kneel down at the football game and pray. If they want to put the camera on you, that's their prerogative. Amen. But when your heart is right, people understand that that's genuine prayer. He's not just doing it to be seen. Because people that are close to him know that he does that in the locker room. He does that at home in the closet. And that's one of our rules here at Relevant Church. Pastor Chuck will tell you, don't do anything at Relevant Church that you won't do at home. So when we're praising and worshiping and you feel like running around the church, but you don't do that at home, then don't bring it here. Because the Bible says everything should be done decently and in order. If you don't cry, cry out to the Lord speaking in tongues at home, then don't come here to the church to do it. Because that means that you're doing it to be seen. Are you following me? Are you following me? Are you following me? So that's a rule that we have here at Relevant Church. Now, if you, if you run around at home and you, you jump up and shout and, and speak in tongues at home, and then you come to Relevant Church and you do that, you say, no, nah, Pastor Chuck, I do this at home. I started this at 7.15 this morning, and this is just carrying over. I brought this from home with me from the car. I, I barely got here because I was, I was shaking and dancing and shouting in the car. Now, if you come in the, in the gate doing that, then, then Pastor Chuck going to let you have your way. Let you do your thing. Because what that's going to do, uh, you, could, you could tell if it was from God because everybody else will join in. Everybody else will feel it. Now, if it's not from God, everybody's going to look at you funny. What is wrong with her? What is wrong with them? You need to sit down. And Pastor Chuck's going to have to pull you to the side say, Sister, so-and-so, we, we, we got a room out back. If you really need to go do that, we can escort you out back and you can go and, and have yourself a hallelujah, Holy Ghost time. Amen. But, but we got service to conduct here and it needs to be decent and in order. So then he says, look, dissensions. These are people that like to stand apart. These are the cliques you see sometimes in churches. We don't have any at this church, but, but in some churches, they have churches that have, they have cliques, and, and, and you're, you have to be a part of this group, or you have to be a part of that group, and then the means of it is to cause division. Hey, 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 we're, 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 we're this Holy Ghost uh, group over there. They're really uh, not that saved. You know, they're, 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 they're really wet behind the ears, and you want to cause uh, division in the church. That's what it means to have dissensions. And then there's heresies, which are false teachings. Oh, this is what the church in America needs to hear. False teachings that bring forth a destructive type of division. Preaching another gospel. Preaching, even in the evangelical church, preaching a gospel that Paul, Peter, James, Jesus did not give us. Amen. So we have to be careful of heresies, of, of preaching false teachings, uh, uh, of preaching new revelations as opposed to possibly new interpretation on old revelation. And then he says envy, pathanos, jealousy that leads to hostile deeds. Matthew 27 and 18, Pilate said, look, I perceive that you have delivered up Jesus Christ because of your envy. Those guys didn't like Jesus because they were jealous of what he was doing. And, and they allowed their jealousy of what he was doing to cause them to lead him into crucifixion, to lead him to death. I mean, you think about how dangerous envy can be. You think about the things that you, you'll do out of a heart, out of an envious heart. These Men gave up Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus spent his time healing the sick, bringing the dead to life, feeding people, 
taking care of people. He spent his three years of ministry loving people. But because of their envy of him, they were willing to execute him. Are you following? Be careful of what you envy in others. It's okay to admire what others are doing. It's okay to admire the attributes that others may have that perhaps you need to work on. It's okay to admire that, but let that inspire you, not destroy you. And then he says murders. Don't need to explain that. But there's a difference between murder and killing. The Bible doesn't say in uh, the Ten Commandments, it doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not wrongly take someone's life doesn't necessarily say that thou shall not kill. In fact, you see throughout the Old Testament, there are times where God commanded for his people to kill. And not only to kill, but to kill everything and everybody. Kill the animals as a part of God's perfect and sovereign will. Amen? But it's it's the murder. So that kind of answers the questions. Well, I'm a Christian. Should I go serve in the army? It's okay for you to serve in the army. And it's okay for you to fulfill your duties, which may involve you getting to confrontations that may ultimately result in you taking of one's life. But those are the rules of engagement. Are you following me? So that does not uh, eliminate you or free you from... From that, but it says, Thou shalt not murder. Even if you're serving in the army, there's still rules on how to kill people and how not to. Well, not so long ago, some, some soldiers were brought up on charges of murder. Right? It's biblical. And then he goes to sins of intemperance, drunkenness, intoxication due to alcohol. Do I need to elaborate on that? Maybe I should spend a, a quick second there because uh, there's no shortage of debate on whether Christians should drink or not drink because the Bible says that, that, that it says just don't become drunk. And some people even, uh, even will go to Jesus uh, turning the water into wine at the wedding of Cana as his first miracle. They say, well, you know, you can have a, li- a little bit, but we talked about it couple weeks ago that even a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And we have to think of things in context of the times that we live in. Now in biblical times, the wine was heavily diluted. It didn't contain the level of alcohol that our present day alcohol contains. In fact, they often would take uh, two parts of whatever the wine was and put three parts of water. Amen? So that it wouldn't become drunk. So it was more of grape juice than it was actually wine that would actually get you intoxicated. Are you following? But then the Bible also tells us in, I believe one of the Proverbs says that that wine is a mocker and strong drink is waging. And he that partakes in it is not wise. Are you following me? And what we have to understand as believers is that we have a witness. We have to understand that we are a witness in the world. And we have to understand that even though to us it may be a simple beer, we just like to have a beer from time to time, but we have to understand that there are people who are watching us. There are people around that will see that, and and to them they, they see that, oh, he's a Christian or she's a Christian and she drinks, so it's okay to drink. Now, I may have a drinking problem, but I can see your witness. And I can see what you're doing, and it may cause me to have a problem. The Bible tells us to to be careful not to cause our brothers and sisters to stumble. So we have to use a little bit of wisdom when we when we uh, decide to indulge in things. Quick way to look at it is: Does it glorify God? You know, there's a lot of question marks as as the Bible says, as He says, and the like. You know, when it comes to and the like, see, we've invented new ways to sin and new ways of debauchery that aren't necessarily listed in the Bible. 
So, so there's, a, there's a lot of questions around some of the things we do. Hey, is it okay to go to Vegas and gamble away all of our life savings? Hey, it doesn't say that we can't do it in the Bible. But when you think of and the like, and the like you have to say, does it glorify God? Does it edify others? And does it glorify God? That's the question that you should be asking when you get the and the likes in your life. When you get to those, those points where the Bible really doesn't say uh, that you can't do this. Remember, focus on the do-dos and not the don't-dos. And you'll be clear. Because see, what I found, truthfully, about people that ask those type of questions all the time, is what they're really asking is, how much can I get away with and still be saved? <laughs> There are people that really just want to push the envelope. I just want to do, I, I want to do the least amount required and still be saved. They're, they're not really, most of the time, at least in my, in my life, people that I've talked to. Now, I don't know about the people you've talked to, but the people I've talked to about those things, when it really comes down to it, I find out what their real motive is, is they really just want to see how much they can get away with and still be saved. Amen? Or they want to be contentious. They just want to argue. And I have no time to argue with people. Amen? Revelries, feasts, and drinking parties that often lead to orgies. Let's see, we're in April, so two months ago, February, they had what you call Fat Tuesday. Better known as Mardi Gras. Perfect example of what a revelry is. The thing about the work of the flesh that is so interesting, the thing about sin and the works of the flesh that you got to know is that interesting, that it always takes something that's good. It always takes something that good, that's good, that God intends for goodness, and it perverts it into something that's evil and destructive. You know what Mardi Gras is? Mardi Gras is the day before the start of Lent. Lent is a season of 40 days of fasting and dedicating yourself to the Lord. Fasting indicating giving up the pleasures of life. So what Mardi Gras is, is a day that you go and pig out before you go on this 40 days of fasting. Now see, the 40 days of fasting is always a good idea. I'm going to take 40 days and, and I'm going to really commit myself to the Lord 40 days leading up to Easter. I'm going to take those 40 days. I'm going to commit myself to the Lord by giving up some of the indulgence of life. I'm going to change my appetite, make it much simpler, give up the sweets and all of this stuff. But, but here we go with the sin comes in. We'll say, hey, well, since you're going to give this up for 40 days, you might want to get it all in. So that's what Mardi Gras is, where you go and you pig out and you drink up and you just do whatever happens when you become drunk and intoxicated. Now, people, now I, I would venture to say that probably 95 to 98 percent of the people who celebrate Mardi Gras make those pilgrimages down to New Orleans have no idea about lit. <laughs> Have no intentions on fasting for 40 days. They just go to party. Amen. See, that's the thing about the fruit of the Spirit. Paul says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. All those things we just listed, the important part, as we know, is the practicing of those behaviors. It, he's saying, when you live a lifestyle of this, he's not saying that this happens to you on occasion. This is not, this is not saying that, that, you know, maybe you have this weakness in you that you're working on and, and sometimes you give in to the temptations uh, of, of these various things. But he, what he's saying is when you practice these things habitually, then you've excluded yourself from the kingdom of heaven because this is your, your accepted lifestyle. I choose to live and I choose to fornicate. I choose to drink up. I choose to do what I want to do. And that's just how I live my life. I'm doing my thing. You do your thing. Stay out of my business. When you have that type of attitude, that's what Paul is saying. Then you forfeited your inheritance in the kingdom of God. And you don't realize that the kingdom of God is not just some pie in the sky before you, when you die. But it's something sound that's on the ground while you're still around. 
That means that, that you can have the kingdom of God right here on earth. What does the kingdom of God here on earth look like? That you have joy even when you shouldn't have? The song says joy unspeakable. When, you, when you, you're joyous about things that you shouldn't be uh, joyous about. Are you following me? When, when you get the pink slip and laid off of your job, you still thanking God that you had the job that long. Are you, are you following me? When, when you get that pink slip at the job and, and you realize that, that we live in a country that has unemployment benefits, and you thank God, well, God, I thank you that they have that temporary assistance that can help me get, you know, because a lot of countries don't have that. That's when you, you have joy, when you, you see the end from the beginning. And you can praise God anyhow. Are you, are you following me? Oh, you can bring the, the kingdom of God right here. But the fruit of the Spirit, he, he, he tells us to walk in the Spirit that you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So powerful of a saying. This is one of those must-have scriptures that you, that you must have memorized, that you must have in your back pocket. That when you walk in the Spirit then you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Whenever you find yourself fulfilling the lust of the flesh, it's usually because you're not walking in the Spirit. Whenever your life begins to unravel around you, it's, it, and the first thing when you come to Pastor Chuck and say, hey, I need counseling, I say, have you been reading your Bible? Oh, no, I've, I've kind of slacked out. Well, there it is. Have you been praying regularly? No, you know, I haven't really been. There it is. Your marriage is in trouble. Have you been praying with your wife or your husband? No, nah, not really. There it is. You been coming to church regularly with your wife and your, and your husband? Are you guys coming together? And uh, You know, not really. Sometimes he goes. Uh, there it is. Are you following me? Walk in the spirit. The more time we spend in the spirit, the less time we spend in the flesh. It's simple mathematics. Simple mathematics. He says to walk in the Spirit, then he says to be led by the Spirit. How can you be led by the Spirit? He says, if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not under the law. He said you won't be legalistic, you won't be worried about performance when you're led by the Spirit. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? That means you've got to know his word. His word is Spirit, according to John 6.63. So in order to be led by the Spirit, you've got to know his word. In order to know what God is saying to you, you've got to recognize the types of things that he says. Are you following me? Well, Pastor, how can you know if it's God's word? Well, it usually sounds like his character. And his character is revealed to what he's already said in his word. Are you following me? And then he says, for he who sows to the flesh, Galatians 6 and 8, for he who sows to the flesh will in the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows in the spirit will in the spirit reap everlasting life. Listen, if you worry too much about this temporary casing, see a lot of times people spend a whole lot of time cosmetizing the corpse to camouflage the curse. I'll say it again. You cosmetize the corpse. You get your nails done, get your hair done, get your new clothes. You, you do so much. You, you work out. You, you do all of this stuff, but this is dying. This body here is temporary. The moment you, you break open the womb, you start to die. The, 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 the clock starts to tick, tick tock, and the time is running out. So he says, be careful, uh, uh, be careful not to put so much in the flesh that you forget to sow in the spirit, that you, forget to, that you forget to come in fellowship with believers. This is why this right here is important. It's important for us to come together on, 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 on some type of a consistent basis to hear the word of God. Together, to grow together. This is important. It's important for us to read the word of God. To have that devotional time in our own personal lives. Amen. See, Pastor Chuck's not always going to be there. Not always going to be available. So you can't rely on me. You have to rely on your own relationship with God. Amen. That's how you sow into the spirit. He said we must stand fast in our freedom. Galatians 5 and 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ, has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, the work of the flesh is a yoke of bondage. It's a, it's a form of slavery. But he says, stand fast in what when Christ has made us free. Jesus said, if any man is in Christ, he is free indeed. Whom the Son says free, excuse me, is free indeed. But here's the thing. 
It's not freedom to sin, it's freedom from sin. See, some people take that and say, well, I'm just free to sin. That means I can do whatever I, I want to do and then God will forgive me and I'm all right. But that's not what he's saying. It's not a license to be hedonistic. Amen? Amen. The contrasting variables here, the works, plural, of the, of the flesh, the fruit of the spirit, singular. Any one of these works of the flesh can destroy you and separate you from God. But the collective fruit of the Spirit is what puts you into God's presence. Not only puts you into God's presence, but it puts you into God's character. The nine fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are all characteristics of God. They're not fruits of the Spirit. It's not, they're not independent of one another. They're all together. They're all one fruit. Are you following me? That's something you need to know as we go along, that you need to have all of this fruit working together. They're nine characteristics, but it's just one fruit. And when you get the, the whole fruit together, you're representing what God is. God is all those things. God is love. God is peace. God is joy. God is faithful. God has self-control. Oh yes, he has self-control because I'm sure he looks down upon this earth and said, man, I should just get the water running again. <laughs> but he promised he wouldn't do that. So he has to stay on his promises. <clears throat> really quickly, some things about fruit. You can look at John 5, 15, verse 1 through 8, when Jesus talks about the vine and the vine dresser, but I just want to go through these really quickly. The fruit begins with a seed. Fruit always begins with a seed. So, so, it, so what that means is you can start small with the fruit. As you go through the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, and you find yourself having some shortcomings, then, then you want to start small. Start with a little love. Start with a little joy. Start with a little faith. Amen? You got to realize that, that people say, well, well, Pastor, how do you get faith? I don't have faith. Well, the Bible says God has dealt every man and woman a measure of faith. Listen, you all are sitting down in these chairs. When you came down here and sat down in that chair, you had faith that that chair was going to support your weight. You didn't question where the chairs came from. You didn't, I didn't see anybody pick up the chair and examine if all the screws were tight. You just came in and you sat down. Some of you even just plopped down. You were just tired and you just plopped down. And, you, and, and, and your faith is what I, Some of you go through drive through windows at your favorite fast food restaurant. And you order your favorite number one, number two. You know the menu by heart. And you order it and you get your food and you proceed to eat it. You have faith that that teller was in a good mood that day? Come on now, you have faith that the person that prepared that food didn't put something in it because they were mad at their boss? That's, that's faith. You, you have faith. You just have to recognize where it's at and then put it into the proper place. So start small. It begins as a seed. Fruit, carpos. It begins as a seed. You can start small and then fruit matures on the vine. Jesus tells us to be connected to the vine. This is what this is. Here's your vine. Relevant church, we are a vine. It's important for you to be connected and to stay connected until the fruit gets mature. You don't want to pluck the fruit too early. See, so I've seen people come to church, they come for about two or three weeks, four weeks, and they think they got it all down. Oh, I'm good. I don't really need that anymore. I can go on and live my own Christian life privately in isolation. And before long, they began to backslide and get back into their normal behavior. So you have, to stay, you have to stay on the vine until you fully mature. You ever go to the grocery market and you see, you see the tomatoes that are there? Those are tomatoes that they sprayed something on to make them red. You know tomatoes aren't naturally red. 
You know, when they pick the tomatoes, when they harvest the tomatoes, they're green, but they spray some stuff on them and, and that makes them, it make, it expedites the ripening process and makes them nice and red. But then you go to that special section over there and you see some tomatoes and they're nice and beautiful and red, but they're still on the vine. I think they call them vine picked tomatoes, but they're healthier for you. They're, they're better for you because they're free uh, uh, of the chemicals. They're on the vine. They're still ripening on the vine. That's why they still stay there. So that's what we need to do as Christians. We have to be connected to the vine. We have to be connected to a church body. Because the most dangerous place for us to be as Christians is to be isolated from other Christians. We have to be around people that care about us, people that love us enough to say, hey, you're doing wrong. Hey, you need to get yourself right. People that can hold you accountable. Then fruit is perpetual, meaning that it reproduces after itself. Genesis chapter 1 and 11 said every fruit, will, every tree shall produce after its own kind. Your fruit will re reproduce fruit in others. Listen, parents, especially the fruit that you're, that you're putting forth by being here today and, and, and generating a legacy of, of, of being connected to the will of God, that's going to pay dividends for your children and your children's children. You're teaching them how to love God and to be in relationship with God. And then the fruit makes up a harvest. Listen, when you put on love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, patience, when you practice those things, then that's the harvest that God is seeking from us. That's the harvest that glorifies him. God is looking for something to glorify himself in the earth. That's why he needs us. That's why he created us to worship him, so that his glory can be seen in the earth. So your fruit makes up the harvest. And then lastly, the fruit grows out on the limbs. Ever notice a fruit tree, the, 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 the fruit always grows out on the limbs. Out on the limb is a very isolated place to be. It's not always the popular place to be. So when we put on the fruit of the spirit, it's not always going to be popular. People are going to want you to be angry, but you're going to say, I'm going to have joy. There's people that say that you should hate that person for doing you wrong, but you say, I'm going to put on love. Some people are going to try to rush you into doing things, but you say, no, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to suffer long because I know that at the end of this thing, God has promised that if, if I be not weary in well-doing, I will reap if I faint not. All you follow me. Some people are going to want you to lose your temper. You should, you should go jump on her. She kissed your boyfriend. And you're going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk to him later. 